Welcome to another episode of He's Not Done Yet. We are so delighted that you tuned in with us today, and uh, we are so honored that you would tune in. You know, He's Not Done Yet is a radio ministry that goes out on Victory Radio Station on 100.9, 95.3, and 1530 a.m., and that goes out on Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. on Faith Talk on 99.5, and then they replay it again on 8 a.m. 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. Uh, We'd love for you to tune in. Of course, we're on, uh, you know, uh, Spotify and and Google Podcast and all the media outlets. Of course, you can go to he'snotdoneyet.com, he'snotdoneyet.com. Feel free to go there, and you can uh, find everything out you'd like to find out. We'd also like to invite you to the First Pentecostal Church. We have church on Sunday morning at 1030 uh, back again on Sunday night at 7 p.m. If you've gone down to one service and you know you want to, uh, you know, come on by for the evening service, we'd love for you to come and we'd love to have you. Feel free to text me at 501 339 8017 and uh, let me know you're coming. You can sit with me and my family. We'd love for you to come. Then we also are back on our midweek service on Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. And that's at 1401 Calvary Road right here in beautiful North Little Rock, Arkansas. Well, today's scripture comes from Proverbs 21 and 21. He that falleth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness, and honor. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. I just thank you today, God. I honor you today, Lord. I worship you. Lord, I pray that this would fall on good ground, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, don't touch that dial. We want you to stay in there and stay with us. We've got a very special guest. I'm telling you, you're going to be so surprised and so just excited about it.
Well, today is a very special day. I tell you, I've got a dear friend of mine that uh, I was just joking around with him a while ago that uh, I've got to invite him to be on He's Not Done Yet to get him to come back across the river here on the north side and uh, uh, to get to speak to him and see him. But um, he is a dear friend of mine, and I have today Reverend Jared Motes, and we are so honored that you're here today, brother. We yes, want sir. you to obey the Holy Ghost and come on in. Yes, sir. Well, Brother Billy Mac, Brother Billy McDougal, I'm sorry. Yes, I love you, brother. I, um, I just want to tell all your listeners and your viewers, if they ever get a chance, they need to come to FPC in North Little Rock. They need to buy this man a cup of coffee, sit down and talk with him. And when you get up from the table, you're going to be ready to conquer the world. This guy is so, he's K-Love. He's positive and encouraging. Oh, Amen. Thank you. And I just love you, brother. You, yes. You're just a humble man. Uh, just You're just a manly man. I just appreciate your friendship. Yes. I appreciate your ministry. This is, I don't walk lightly on anybody's ministry. I take this serious. I feel like God did give me something today. It's been brewing for really months now, and uh, when you asked me to come, I knew what we was going to be sitting here talking about, and it's just the name of your podcast, He's Not Done Yet. It's just, well, I, I'm just going to start right now. I mean, he's not done yet. I've had a last couple years of my life have been just absolutely amazing, uh, just God has just opened the windows of heaven, uh, made me do things that got me out of my comfort zone, amen, and, uh, and here we are. So uh, a couple years ago, God led me to Hot Springs, and uh, I was at there, and I was praying, and I had a heavy burden, and uh, it was just God was just working on me, and just and I, the, the layout there at the church is... A, the pulpit is about, I don't know, two and a half foot above ground level. And so I'm on my knees and I'm hanging on to one of the, the uh, columns of the pulpit. And God's just dealing with me and it's heavy. And I'm just, God, whatever it is, Lord. And I'd been, I'd just been dealing with all kinds of emotions. And I just gave up right there, hanging on to that uh, pulpit. And I'm like, God, whatever it is you want me to do, whatever, if you want me, just, if you want me to sell pencils for a living, what I don't know what is going on, God, just, but whatever you do. And I remember Pastor Nathan Holmes, and I, the, the message that he preached one time, and it just said this, walk through the middle of the door. And I told God, I said, whatever you, door you want to open, God, I'm going to walk right through the middle of it. And sure enough, I'm, you know, we're, uh, this is two years down the road now. And uh, God has opened some doors, unbelievable doors. You wouldn't believe it. But anyway, I walked, I was at my pastor's house, my brother, Joel Motes, and uh, he was headed to a missionary trip with Brother Alviar, and uh, and we were just sitting there visiting, there was other men there, and uh, I just kind of, I'd never been on the mission field, and I was like, I just want to see it, I mean, I've heard stories my whole life about faith and everything that goes on, and so I was like, man, I I want to go with you. I just want to, you know, just hang out and visit. And so a little bit later, some other guys, was they were like, hey, we want to go too. And, it, and so it, it was almost like a men's trip by the time we got done. <laughs> and uh, my brother told me this. He said, you can go. At it. I mean, he said, but just know this. When you get there, you're going to have to preach. I was like, Psh. my whole life has changed since then and so I felt like my whole life I've been you know uh, my daughter Emily she's been calling me to preach since she was little uh, everybody 
used to ask me, like after my brothers got churches, when are you going to get your church? And I'm like, and I just felt like I was really just kind of keeping that call to, you know, held back. And so I knew God was stirring on, uh, stirring in my mind and in my heart. And I told Emily one day, this was before I got the call, basically. And uh, I, I could feel it coming. And I'm, and I'm to that point, I'm about to accept this. But I told Emily, I said, I, I think I got the title to my first message, if I ever preach. And she's doing the dishes. And she's like, what is it, Dad? I'm like, the title will be Run, Jonah, Run. <laughs> so, ah, boy, I got a kick out. She didn't yeah, get a kick out of that title. Oh, and uh, so anyway, I was just teasing her. And, and so then I, I guess I should have backed up told that part before I told when God opened the door, basically, to preach. And so I start praying, and I'm studying, and I'm praying, and I can't get nothing and that title keeps coming back to me, Run, Jonah, Run. And that was the first message I ever preached. It was in Brazil, Run, Jonah, Run. But obviously, I'm not talking about run away from Nineveh. I'm talking about run to Nineveh. And uh, God God anointed me. Uh, five people got the Holy Ghost that night. I was just amazed, you know. And uh, God just from that time forward, uh, just been, you know, the devil attack you. He'll tell you you ain't good enough for this, you ain't good enough for that. But I don't know. There's a scripture in the Bible about it. When a man puts his hand on the plow, just keep pushing, you know. So anyway, so here we are, two years later. And uh, but you know, you don't. God don't just start opening doors everywhere. So I started uh, following this really the same formula that my brothers follow. Pastor Jeremy Motes, Pastor Joel Motes, and they just really, they started in retirement centers, retirement centers and prisons. And so after we come back from Brazil, I, I got me a, a, found me a nice retirement center. And uh, these really, it's, it's uh, they don't, it's, I don't know, what, what do they call that, an adult center? But anyway, it's, these people are not, they're cognizant. Yeah. And they can they, they live on their own, but they all gather there. And uh, so I started preaching every Sunday. And uh, so I got moved forward, and then I got, uh, I got my name in with the uh, chaplain at uh, Haskell, the Benton Work Release Program. I got to start going to prisons. And uh, so god God just moves I mean it's just weird how it all works it's like I say it's still blowing my mind but the story I want to tell today is about a man I met at the work release program and uh, it's you know Esther Queen Esther when she went before the king to save her people it was for such a time as this and I don't know, when God's timing and his purpose, when they get together, beautiful things are going to happen. I mean, and so the first night, it was I didn't have a badge yet to get into the prison, so I had to have a badged person to go with me. Well, my pastor, my brother Joel Motes, he had a badge. And so we're headed to the service, and uh, he, we're talking about this man that, we, that he... Um, he had heard from Brother Blakely, Bishop Blakely, this man that used to be with him is in this prison. And so we uh, got to the service, and, I, and I'll tell you this story. I, I, I asked uh, Pastor Michael Joe Blakely if I could tell this story because there's, there's a lot of family and stuff involved, and, I, and really it's all to the glory of God, honestly. I just wanted to run it. I ran it by him a few nights ago. But on our way to the prison, my brother's telling me, he said, man, there's a guy in this prison that used to be Bishop Blakely's right-hand man. And uh, we was like, wow. So so we went, and we uh, 
We went to the service and he he didn't show up. Well, we had the guards call and tell him the chaplain needs to see him. And so he came in and he was kind of wild out because when a chaplain calls you, it's usually bad, you know. And so we he figured out who we were and he he, he came he came to service and the man got the Holy Ghost that night, renewed in the Holy Ghost, right there in prison, and it was a it, it was just my it was mind blowing to me. But um, well, his story, Hallelujah, his story. He used to be, like I said, a right hand man to Bishop Blakely. He was a soul winner. He uh, he was a preacher even, and and just you know the life, the devil, Satan, he attacks and he keeps attacking until he wins. And this man had fell into sin and. Uh, we uh, life goes on, and this is where he ended up, and this is where we ended up. Time and in purpose, and uh, so we got, he got the Holy Ghost, and we thank God for it. And he started coming every service, and every service he would pry, cry and pray, and he had the Holy Ghost, and uh, it was a beautiful thing, and so. There for a little while, my brother, once I got my badge, my pastor brother, Joel, he, would, he wouldn't go, and I'd have to go by myself. So this past, it was getting close to this past Christmas. And uh, Brother Burroughs, he hadn't showed up in a couple services. and We was kind of, you know, where's he at? Well, we had these other people we're working on, but we're wondering where he's at. And finally... He shows back up, come to find out he had been on a furlough, and um, I think his daughter was driving him around. He was telling her to take him, this, take him there, take him here. And she dropped him off at the house, and, and you know what? It, Satan was on him again, and she had dropped him off at a house she wasn't even aware of, but it was a crack house. And uh, she couldn't believe what was going on. It took him like an hour to come back out. So when she figured it out, she was upset. Everybody was upset. She was like, I'm not taking you on any more furloughs. Because, I mean, she basically had to sign him out. And uh, anyway, so he came, uh, he missed a couple services. And then getting close to Christmas, he showed back at service. And God gave me this message. And I'm just going to give the highlights because I don't know how much time we have. But uh, he showed up, and I preached this message. And the title of it was Exposing the Wedge. And uh, I'm just going to kind of give you some highlights of this message. Genesis 50, the 18th verse. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants, and Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. So if you can imagine this time in Joseph's life, he's the governor of Egypt, and he's basically sitting on a throne. And there was some guys, his brothers, coming up. They're starving. There's no, there's no corn in Israel. They're coming to Egypt. And the very person that they put in that pit that they was jealous of, that coat of many colors, that ended up getting sold into slavery, Joseph had it bad. He went to Potiphar's house, was lied on, went to the jail, was forgotten about. And I don't know how many years it is. I've, I've done the research. I can't remember, but I think around 16 years. Don't quote me on that. But it was a long time. And these guys that had caused him that much misery are now coming up to him, kneeling down to him. They don't even know it's his brother, their brother. But he had the authority. He had the authority to probably throw them in a pit, sell them into slavery, you know. He's the governor of Egypt, but he chose to forgive. He chose to forgive. And, I, and, I, and I'm just going to hit some brief topics on what I was preaching to Brother Burroughs this night. 
and it really changed his life. And I was hoping some of your listeners, viewers, I'm hoping this will change their life. But we know what a wedge is. It's something that drives something apart. And first and very most, don't ever let any wedge, anything, any of Satan's weapons drive a wedge between you and the pulpit. Amen. Uh, I mean, it is, that is his, he is a deceiver. He is a liar. And that's his biggest game plan is to get you disconnected from your place of worship, your, anything that has to do with God. He wants to separate you. That's what a wedge does. It separates you. And so I started preaching about the wedge and how it started, but this particular wedge that I wanted to preach about was the wedge, and it's in the atmosphere, it is in this world today, and it is an unforgiving spirit. Hallelujah. And so you can imagine I'm sitting there preaching to a bunch of prisoners about an unforgiving spirit, and that is a lot that I'm telling you just about every prisoner that's in prison today Something's happened in their life. There was a wedge that was driven in their life. People have done them wrong. They've done other people wrong. Sometimes they can't even forgive their self. And it was so, and I just was preaching and I'm telling, talking about the Adam and Eve. It started in the garden. The disobedience of one man led us all to sin. Amen. And so sin is a wedge between us and God. And uh, we move on, and the, the law was given to Moses. And the law, you know, God gave that new covenant with them. But the law just kind of exposed sin. It kind of gave a, a correction for sin, but it did not redeem uh, the people. And so finally, God came down. God came down, and he nailed all of our sins on the cross. And when um, I was thinking about it, when he did that, he was forgiving us our sins. And so as I go on, uh, Matthew 12, 31 says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. I was trying to expose wedges this whole time I'm preaching to these prisoners. And like I said, God nailed it to his cross. But now that he has been to the cross, he died for our sins so we could be forgiven. Now he requires us to forgive others, to, to give that same mercy to others. And I was preaching, and I was just telling them all, you can, everything in your life, it's, it's uh, you, can, you can try to pinpoint it on something, you can try to blame somebody for something, but really all blaming does is just, it just rips off the scab. And you never can heal from it. And uh, failing to forgive carries heavy weight. When I say heavy weights, it's consequences between now and eternity. Forgiving others is an option. You have an option. You can forgive or you can not forgive. But that not forgiven, it's a hot, hot consequence. And an eternity of, of a hot consequence. I remember when I was a little boy, um, I had a cousin named Kevin Taylor, and um, I don't know what happened that day. I know he aggravated me so bad. I was I was a little guy. I was sitting on the curb, just really, just probably mad and crying, you know. And anyway, he was a few years older than me, and I'll never forget this. And I don't even remember what was said or done, but he come up to me, and he said, "Jared," he said, "I man, I'm sorry." He said, please forgive me. If you don't forgive me, I'm going to go to hell. I was like, well, that puts you in a, puts you in a spot. Somebody thinks they're going to go to hell because I won't forgive. I, I just, I forgave him. And I obviously forgot it. 
I still forgot. I don't even realize. I don't. I can't even remember what was said. But everybody needs forgiveness from everybody. Uh, so anyway, we was going on. I kept preaching, and Jesus said this. He said, "They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." He was wanting us to get that wedge out of our life. Um, started talking, and I just, and I'm sorry, I'm just going over just this message, and, and I'm preaching my heart out to this guy, well, to these prisoners, but I'm, it, this guy is soaking it up, Brother Burroughs. He done messed up. He's coming back. Uh, I told, this is one of the scriptures I wrote, Proverbs, not I wrote, I preach Proverbs 28 and 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And, uh, you know, it, it, started, it started working on him. Hallelujah. And he started praying. He started crying. And uh, really, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward. I'm going to tell you this story. I don't know how much time we have, honestly. But... You can Google this story. This is not my story, but this was what I was researching when I was getting this message. And I'm just going to read it because I think it, it, really, it really drove home what, what I was preaching. And it says this, A young boy had found a faller's wedge a little over a foot long in a field, and it was time for dinner. So he placed the wedge in the middle of the limbs of an oak tree there beside his house. Went through the gate. His mother was calling him for supper. He put it right there, and he went in and ate supper. And the little boy totally forgot about this wedge that he had set in that young tree. And so he goes on, the, and, and, you know, he was trying, he thought he would give it to his dad that evening or put it in the barn so his dad could use it, and, you know. But anyway, he left it there, and then once you go on, it's just kind of like this. You're out of sight, you're out of mind, amen? And so through the years, this this young tree started growing and growing. And for too long, it was a great, big, beautiful oak tree. Hallelujah. The young boy now is a gray-haired man. Hallelujah. He goes to bed one night, and I'm thinking he must have lived in Arkansas because there came a ice storm. And uh, anyway, the ice starts gathering on this oak tree. And all of a sudden, just like it happens in life, the storms get too heavy. And all of a sudden, bam, one of the, le one of the limbs fall. And all of a sudden, when that falls, it jars the whole tree. And they just, every limb starts splintering. And before you know it, the whole tree is on the ground. And uh, so the whole town, they come the next day. They're looking and they can't believe this huge, beautiful oak tree. Oak trees are hardwood. They're supposed to stand the test of time. And, uh, you know, you could, you could, they wouldn't have even thought twice about it if it was a pine tree. But this was an oak tree, huge. And so the old man, he's confused. He's like, well, how did this happen? He still lives there at, at the, his old home place. And he got to walking around and through all the splinters and all the stuff. And he looks and he sees that wedge that he had put in that tree many, many years ago. Hallelujah. And so, said all that, I'm just telling you, sometimes there is dangers in hiding wedges in our heart. 
you know what? I know that there are people here today all through this world that people have hurt them. They have done things to them. You know, I, 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 I look, the more I'm around ministry, the more I see into people's lives and the more I'm thankful for my heritage. I mean, we grew up normal people. But the world is full of dysfunctional families, dysfunctional things that have happened to people. And a lot of people will put that seed or that wedge of unforgiveness deep down in their heart. And they'll let it, you know, they'll sear their conscience. They'll just let it callous over. And they'll go through life thinking they're fine. Hallelujah. But when the storms of life hit, when the storms of life hits, that's when everything comes crashing down. And so I was preaching, and I started thinking about people who, uh, well, Joseph, he chose to forgive. But what happened to Esau? Now listen to this. This is something I just, I was reading, and I was thinking, Esau, Jacob, Jacob stole his, or he, well, I mean, he he snuck his birthright. I mean, you know, a bowl of beans. So he, he, he got him while he was down. So just think about Esau's mindset. My brother just basically stole it for a bowl of beans, my birthright. Then you get older, and it's time for Isaac to give the blessing. And now his mama got his brother schemed up a plan, and got his blessing from his daddy. It should have been, what, Abraham, Isaac, Esau is what the line should have been. And so can you imagine you're Esau and you're going through life? The Bible says Esau never found a place of repentance. But can you imagine his mindset? I, I can imagine his mindset. My mama done tricked me. My brother done tricked me. I mean, this guy was upset, but it don't matter. It don't matter what people do. I'm telling you, everybody has to find a place of repentance. Pride will keep you from repenting. You can ask Satan about that. Pride got him kicked out of heaven. Hallelujah. But anyway, I started thinking, these, you know, Esau, wow, wow, it's a, can't imagine him going through life. But thank God that we have found a place of repentance. We have found a place to lay our burdens down. Hallelujah. If you can just do whatever it takes. I'm, I'm begging people today. Do whatever it takes. I was reminded of the story talking about forgiveness. It's just, this is not Bible. This is uh, Brother Norman Clifton. I mean, this is what I was preaching about that night, Brother and I don't know the details, and he can come on and tell it or whatever, but I do know that there was a man here that had something to do with the death of his daughter. I don't know the details, but all I know is Bishop Holmes was preaching about forgiveness one time and holding bitterness in your heart. And he went home that Sunday and called that man and forgave him of whatever it was. Like I said, I don't know the story, but it would be a hard, it was a, it took a lot of courage, a lot of uh, Holy Ghost for him to make that call. And I know he's been blessed ever since, no doubt about it. And there's no condemnation anymore with Brother Clifton as far as that situation goes. And so I, I preached this whole message and this man, he, he came to the altar and he cried and he prayed and he was on the left side over here. He stayed there speaking in tongues until everybody had left. It was just me. I think I had somebody with me and him. And we walked out. And uh, moving forward, it was close to Christmas. And uh, I, a few days later, I got a call from my pastor, 
He said, was Brother Burroughs, was he, uh, did he, was he speaking in tongues or anything? You know, did he have the Holy Ghost when you seen him last? I was like, yeah, actually. Well, at first I was confused. I couldn't even think. I was like, what are you talking about? And so he had left there and he had gotten COVID. I don't know, very soon after, like a day or two after. And we know uh, COVID gets you down and then you sit there too long and you get pneumonia. Well, anyway, they had to take him out of that prison and took him to a hospital. And, but before this happened, Hallelujah. Ain't God good. He has started calling his family, apologizing, forgiving, uh, making it right with all of his family. And then he got sick. And do you know that man never made it out of that hospital? I went to the funeral. I was shocked, honestly. Uh, when I tell you this man was a soul winner, Brother Blakely's church was literally full and they were putting out chairs to this man. This is, and I, I seen some of the chaplains there. The chaplains were just amazed, you know. He said, I've never, ever seen a prisoner with this many people that loved him. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just saying, when, when, when you say he's not finished yet, he is not finished yet. God called me at the perfect time, went to the prison at the perfect time. This man's life was changed forever at the perfect time. And I'll tell you this, this is God's mercy. This man was going to be a free man in six weeks. God doesn't look back at what he did on his furlough. He said he's got the Holy Ghost. Let's do this now before something happens. I believe that with all my heart, and, and and that's that's what his daughters thought also. So anyway, I, a few more things. Um, it's just been a whirlwind. Last couple years has been a whirlwind. I, I was telling you earlier. Um, oh, let's see. I kind of get it in a row. I, I was I was praying. I, I was starting to help my my nephew. Brother Darren Motes, God had talked to him. He was pastoring in Amity, Arkansas. And God had told him he needs to uh, go home. And he fought it. He fought it. He told me. He said, and uh, it just it just it just kept fighting. And, and what happened? This is, I mean, God orchestrates everything. My brother is is building a new church and it's really really soon to completion so we're happy about that but um god was orchestrating he needed brother darren at his church and god was telling darren you need to go home and that all worked itself out well i had, he had told me to uh start coordinating services there and so this was back in man, i'm terrible with days and times i wish my wife was here she give you every date, everything. But somewhere around October, November, I started coordinating services at Amity. And we was bringing in preachers from the church. And uh, anyway, uh, God starts moving. And in January, uh, Hot Springs did a first fruits prayer. And so for the first 30 nights in January, it was Holy Ghost prayer every night, unless it was a service night. And so he didn't want a bunch of people going to Amity, so he just said, you just do all of January. So we got through that. And then in February, I, or getting close to February, I called my pastor. I was like, what are we going to do February? He said, well, he said, you just, you just take it. He said, yeah, I mean, you know, the people, the people who was loving us and, Everything just, I'm, I'm just telling you, everything is just unfolded, brother. But when we started coordinating, and this this is to God be the glory stuff. This ain't Jared Motes. This ain't nothing. But there was a man in the church that had been wanting me a year ago before that 
to look at these lots in this neighborhood. He said, man, I think we can, we could build on these lots and all this and that. And I just wasn't really, wasn't there. I, I just didn't have the mindset this guy had. And I said, I just kind of, uh-huh, uh-huh, just, yeah, okay, sounds good. Anyway, it was like almost a year later. Uh, I'm coordinating these services, and it's it takes time. I mean, when you're doing three, you know, what was we doing? Two services plus going full time at Hot Springs. It was taking a lot of time, and I was working full time in Little Rock, commuting, and uh, just God's just started moving. So He came back to me about these lots, and then when I went and looked at them, I said, "Yeah, let's go look at." Them. When I went and looked at them, I was, I pulled in the neighborhood. I was like, you got to be kidding me. There was 19 lots in this neighborhood. And uh, we we went and I looked. And I, I'm going to just tell you, I know some of your viewers know brother, uh, or brother Matt and sister Jamie Herndon. Uh -huh. When I pulled in that neighborhood, I felt like I was in their neighborhood. I mean, Brother Pomeroy lives there. I, I mean, this is a beautiful neighborhood. And this guy was selling 19 lots for $300,000. And so if you do the math, if you do the math, that's $15,700-something a lot. And uh, this was kind of close to November, and this guy was like, I, my bank won't let me, uh, wants to wait till the first to do anything. Yeah. And uh, so we, I said, bro, I think my bank will do it. I think they will do it. And uh, anyway, long story short, we did. I He bought 10 lots. I bought nine lots. And, and this is the beautiful thing. This is to God be the glory. He's not done yet. We got um, the appraisals back. Every one of these lots were fifty to sixty thousand a piece, and so Ooh. we're sitting on Ooh. all kinds of equity. I mean, this is just falling out of heaven, brother. You hear me? Yeah. Falling out of heaven, and I mean, we're we're literally about to put the sign on the first house, like in a week or two. And uh, anyway, it's just so God made a God made a way. I said, Lord, I've done heard plenty of preachers talking about it. And I'm like, they said that if if you work for me, I'll work for you. You know what I mean? That's what they that's what God would tell these preachers. And so I just kind of said, Well, I mean, I didn't verbally hear him say it, but I'm gonna step out on faith. And so I was being a little uh stingy, but I worked. Uh, New Year's Day, I wanted to get that last federal holiday pay. And on January 3rd, I was off the 2nd. January 3rd was my last day at the VA, last day of nursing. And uh, I'm telling you, it's just been uh, its just been a whirlwind, bro. It's just been a whirlwind. I, my mind is blown. I, people just... Uh, anyway, I took, I'm took. i pastor of Amity now, and... I guess I'm a contractor, but I got another guy building a house for me, uh, and it's just God's blessing. Hallelujah. There's so much equity on these pro yeah. these, these projects. Yeah. It's just God, he's got the next two or three years just lined out for me, Yeah. and all I got to do is pray, study, preach. Hallelujah. Uh, it's just, I, I'm just telling you, those, you know, you need to, you need to change the name. To he's not finished yet. <laughs> he's not finished he's yet. He's not finished yet. That's a beautiful Hallelujah, song right brother. there, bro. Yes. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to come and be a blessing. And you've always been a blessing to me, oh, brother. Oh, I, thank you. I know. Um, I don't know. It's just I, I just I love good friends. I love fellowshipping with good friends and. I just want to tell your people, tell your viewers, really, it all boils down to please, 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 if there's something in your heart, it's th this really is a heaven or hell issue. It's heaven or hell. He says, if you do not forgive, That's right. I will not forgive. That's right. 
Hallelujah. Oh, and so Thank I just you, I, I wanna I wanna just encourage somebody, edify somebody, challenge somebody to just keep praying and ask God to reveal what is there, that that hidden wedge that's in your life that could literally shatter your life when the storm of life hits. But if you got that wedge out, see that wedge, when it's in your, when, when it was in that tree, them fibers had to grow around it. And that's where the strength is in them fibers. If they can just weave around their selves, that's what makes a hardwood but they had to go around a wedge and it created weakness. And that's when the storm of life hit. That's when everything tears apart. You feel like you're strong. You got this thick bark around you. I mean to tell you, it's that inner core. Once it's, once it's challenged, hallelujah, if you ain't got that out, if you ain't got them fibers connected together, Oh, God, help us all. Help us all. I love yes, you. I love oh, you, brother. brother. I appreciate you well, having me. Haven't you been blessed? Oh, My goodness. goodness, I tell you. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for oh, it today, God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I don't want to win. Oh, you got out of the buckle. Oh, Jesus. Oh, brother, you blessed us today, brother. Wow, brother. Had Jesus. no idea. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, we just thank y'all. Thank you, brother, so Hallelujah. much. And and I know you've been blessed today. And we're going to invite our pastor in. He's going to sing a song, and it's called Worth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you cleared me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free I could be whole I could tell everyone I know
changed my life You thought I was worth keeping So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed 